What a great day to be in God's house. Great morning so far, huh? Well, I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, Last week, we examined uh, the principle about complaining hinders training. If you weren't here, you definitely want to get that uh, podcast and look at it because complaining hinders training. God is in the process of training us, and there's nothing, if any of you guys that have had kids, you know that complaining always hinders what you're trying to do, and and we're all big kids too, so it hinders us too. Um, but today I want to share with you guys the most uh, difficult scripture in the Bible. If you guys can master this scripture, your walk uh, will be radically different, and it's, it's really almost impossible to walk this particular scripture out. Um, now let me just jump in and tell you what it is. It's Matthew 6, 24. And Jesus says this, I tell you not to worry about your everyday life. We can stop right there. We can pray and then leave. Because right there is the most difficult thing you and I will ever deal with is our day-to-day life. He goes on to say this, don't worry about your everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? So isn't there more to us than the outside? If you want to look at, think of that, think of a car, shiny. You can spend all your time shining the outside of the car, but it's under the hood that makes everything work. That is the most important part. And he says, you're way more important than the outside stuff that we chase after continually to make us okay on the inside. He says, so don't worry, in verse 31, he says, don't worry about these things, saying what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God. Make that a first priority in your life. Above all else, and live righteously. Do what you know to do today. And he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Take today, today's trouble is enough for today. Man, if we could learn those scriptures enough to where they sink deep enough, and that's how we face life, our lives would be a thousand times easier. If I could live today handling today's trouble well. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So what is the command? Handle it well. Handle today's trouble. Now we have a great example of this as we continue our study in the book of Exodus from 20,000 feet. So we're basically looking outside the window of an airplane, looking down on the Exodus, watching this thing unfold, and we have that vantage point of thousands of years into the future. So today we sit thousands of years into the future looking back on their journey to learn from their experience and their own obedience how to live. You know, people are people are always teaching us. Some people are great examples of what not to do, and other people are great examples of what to do. And we ourselves are an example to ourselves of the pluses and minuses. So we're always learning. So, as Chris prayed today about deliverance, deliverance is a God thing. You don't have to do anything. You might have pleaded to God at some point in life to deliver you from something, or you may be pleading today that God will deliver you from something. That's not the same thing as walking with God. So, in the case of the Israelites, these people had spent 430 years as slaves to the Egyptians. God, through a process, delivered them. And now he begins the training on how to live exactly what Jesus says in 624. One day at a time in obedience. One day at a time in obedience is better than anything you can accomplish in any area of life. So as we... Continue here, we need to realize that these guys have a backstory. Everybody in this room has a backstory, has their history. So the 
Israelites grew up generation after generation after generation in bondage to the Egyptians. The Egyptian world, Egypt itself, was considered the breadbasket of the world at that point in time. You can go all the way back to Genesis when a guy named Joseph, who was in prison, was dealing uh, and had interpreted some dreams, and the Pharaoh at that time had a dream about cows, fat cows and thin cows, and he couldn't make heads or tail out of it. So they brought Joseph in, and he told him, hey, there is going to be seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. You need to build granaries. You need to prepare for this famine. You need to do these things. And he listed out some things for them to do to provide during this time. Well, Pharaoh did it. Joseph got elevated. He was given great land, and the people of Israel flourished for a while. But that scenario set Egypt up to be the breadbasket of the wor known world at that time. 430 years later, the Israelites saw that. Not only were they the breadbasket, but they had the Nile River running through. And yearly, that river would flood and cover the plains all around it, making the soil rich and fertile. So Egypt was able to produce much farmland, much produce. Not only that, they had a great amount of livestock who had drinking water. There were tributaries and little ponds off the Nile River and little creeks that would flow. Water was abundant in Egypt. Not only that, the, the, the Nile River flowed through Egypt and into other lands. Tremendous amount of trading took place on the Nile River. Egypt had it going on economically. And as I shared with you a minute ago, they were the breadbasket. That is what the Israelites came out of. Even though they were slaves, they were in the land of plenty. They just didn't have it. So God comes along and delivers them. And he takes them into the desert. After the Red Sea, they broke, the end of Egypt's reign was done. And so the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, and then they started going to nomad wilderness land. How many know that when you start walking with God, it often gets darker before it gets light? There is something that takes place. So these guys don't know what it's like. And so God leads them into the place of want because he wants to teach them how to walk with him daily, just like Jesus said. So we get that example. So that's the backdrop. That's the story of where they came from and now where they're going. So let's pick it up in Exodus 15, 22. Then Moses led the people of Israel away from the Red Sea, and they moved into the desert of Shur. They traveled in this desert for three days without finding water. Remember, the cloud is leading them. God is with them, and he leads them away from water, a basic necessity. They get three days away. They have all this livestock with them. They have about two million people, and there's no water. What do they do? They, kept, they complain. They panic. And it says this. They arrived there on the... F Oops, I'm sorry. They traveled the desert three days without finding any water. When they came to the oasis of Marah, the water was too bitter to drink. So they called the place Marah, which means bitter. Then the people complained and turned against Moses. What are, you, what are we going to drink, they demanded. So Moses cried out to the Lord for help, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. Moses threw it into the water, and this made the water good to drink. It was there at Merah that the Lord set before them the following decree as a standard to test their faithfulness to him. So he says, I've led them, Mo, over to this place because I am setting as a baseline for them to test them to have faith in me. 
I intentionally led them to this place. He said, and this is what the lesson is. If you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, obeying his commands and keeping all his decrees, then I will not make you suffer any of the diseases I sent on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. He goes, my goal is to heal you, but you have a, a part to play, and that's to obey what I say. He did it very gently. These people are a month into their freedom. They're babes. And so basic necessities are messing with their heads. Now, I tell people sometimes, they go, Joe, you know what? I never experienced God. I, I just don't, I don't, you know, I don't feel him. I don't, you ate today, right? You drank today, right? You had something to drink? Yeah, God's working on your behalf. So he tells them this. You see, remember, gang, what happened to the Egyptians. I asked Pharaoh one simple thing. Let my people go for three days that they could go out into the desert and worship me. I gave Pharaoh a simple command. He rejected it. I kept going back to him. And every time I went back, that bread basket, I took a little bit of the bread out. I took a little bit of the bread out. I kept taking bread out in a step by 10 plague step to where the bread basket of the world became completely empty. He says, you guys, you Israelites, are completely empty. You have nothing. If you obey me, I will add bread every step of the way. I will prosper you as you obey my commands. And you will be the head, not the tail. You will be the giver, not the beggar. I will take care of you. So remember that. This is standard practice. This is, I'm doing this. I intentionally led them away from water to show them where the water comes from and that if I lead you somewhere, there's a plan in it. There's a training involved. And as we talked a lot about last week, complaining hinders the training. So Moses is given this information. They are given water. God is gracious to them. Then in chapter 16, what did Jesus say? Don't worry about water, what you drink, what you'll eat. He's already in their initial walk with him, teaching them about water. Now he's going to teach them about eating, that all of that comes from God. God. Verse 16, chapter 1, I mean, verse, chapter 16, verse 1. Then the whole community of Israel set out from Elam and journeyed into the wilderness of sin. They're going deeper into the wilderness. They had stayed a couple of weeks by the oasis, and now the cloud is moving them to another place. It says, they arrived there on the 15th day of the second month, one month after leaving the land of Egypt. So they're 30 days into their, sobri uh, their uh, freedom. Yeah, sobriety, that's, that's weird. You guys wouldn't get it, but there are people out there. <laughs> there too, the whole community of Israel complained about Moses and Aaron. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt. They moaned. There we sat around pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we wanted, all the varieties of bread we wanted. But now you have brought us into the wilderness to starve us all to death. I'm not going to go over everything we talked about last week, but a couple things. Complaining always exaggerates the past. It was so good when we were slaves in Egypt. Anybody ever heard about romancing the past? Romancing our stuff, we, we, we tend to make it way better and bigger and awesomer than it was. I went fishing. I remember when I went fishing and I caught a fish in my mouth. Yay, big! You know, that, that whole mentality. And complaining also takes us to blaming people. Because the problem was they were really blaming God. But it's easier to blame people. It makes us look a little bit better. So God, in his response to them, is very gentle. These are young, young children in walking with God. They're 30 days into their journey. 
So there, everything trips them out. Now, later on in Exodus, he will deal more harshly because they've been with him for 40 years. God expects more when you walk longer with him than when you just start the journey. But the standard never changes. Walk with him today. Hopefully, if you've been walking with God for a chunk of time, you're more comfortable in realizing that all I got to do is do what's right today. All I got to do. Every time we do that, we add prosperity to our lives and, and, and we add plus to our lives, whether it's emotional, spiritual, relational, all that stuff gets out. Every time we disobey, we take a little bit out. We take a little bit out. God's desire is to bless us richly, but he also understands us as individuals and where we're at. So then it tells us, what's the Lord's response to this? Then the Lord said to Moses, look, I'm going to rain down food from heaven for you. I'm going to show them I take care of them. Each day the people can go out and pick up as much food as they need for that day. I will test them in this to see whether or not they will follow my instructions. He said, my base standard with the water is whether they will trust me. He says, now I'm going to, I told them they need to trust me. I brought them water. I made it good for them. Now I'm going to test them to see if they will follow my simple instruction. What was the instruction? Gather up enough food for today. I will provide it. You gather for today. He says, now on the sixth day, they will gather food. And when they prepare it, there will be twice as much as usual. He goes, now they are to gather it until they get to the day before Sabbath. Or on Sabbath, they will gather twice as much food. He doesn't tell them why yet. Why? Because that's the way God is with us oftentimes. He'll give us something to do in an individual basis, but not give us the full explanation. They don't know that they're going to get a Sabbath rest. These were slaves. They never got a day off. They never understood that principle that God actually wants his people to rest and enjoy life too. So he says, and then they are to gather twice as much on this one day of the week. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, by evening you will realize it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You're going to get it in a new way. They already knew he brought them out. They had seen the ten plagues. They had gone through all that stuff. But something about it didn't sink into them. In the morning, you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your complaints, which are against him, not against us, Moses said, added. The Lord will give you meat to eat in the evening and bread to satisfy you in the morning, for he has heard all your complaints against him. What have we done? Yes, your complaints are against the Lord, not against us. So then Moses and Aaron said this, announce this to the entire community of Israel, everyone that's out there, these two million people or so. Present yourselves before the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole community of Israel, they looked out toward the wilderness there they could see the awesome glory of the Lord in the cloud. Now remember, two million people, some of them are going to be way, they're spread out. They are spread out. That's a lot of place. So they looked to where the cloud was. The cloud has been with them the whole time. But God was going to do something different in the cloud that day. He was going to show his glory. He was going to advertise him in a way that they had never seen before. Glory always has the idea of overwhelming light and powerful presence. And overwhelming, like a blanket of presence over you. So that God was showing them something they had never seen before. You know, when you walk with God... There will be those times when God shows you himself in a way you've never seen him before. You've never experienced him before. They had known about the God who delivered them. They had been following the cloud. They followed it for three days to their credit, and they followed it out there. But in this particular time, they saw God differently. Well, how did they see him? What was one of the things they saw? They saw that he was the God with them in adversity. 
They were complaining as if God didn't see their situation. The God who had led them to be hungry, and by the way, none of them were starving. We're talking a couple days. Don't, I, as I shared last week, a lot of us get that. I'll go over to the refrigerator and open it, and it's full. Nothing to eat in here. They weren't in any way, shape, or form in super trouble. They could have killed the animals. They could have done a lot of things. So God was showing them, I'm going to take care of you, and I am with you in adversity. I don't ditch you when the trouble gets rough. I don't ditch you when it's hard and come back when it's great. So that evening, after they saw that in the morning, they waited all day. That evening, something happens. Then the Lord said to Moses, I, verse 11, Now tell them, in the evening you will have meat to eat, and in the morning you will have all the bread you want, then you will know that I am the Lord your God. You will know. So, that evening, vast numbers of quail flew in and covered the camp. And the next morning, the area around the camp was wet with dew. When the dew evaporated, a flaky substance as fine as frost blanketed the ground. The Israelites were puzzled when they saw it. They said, what is it? What is it is another name for manna. They asked each other. They had no idea what it was. And Moses told them, it is the food the Lord has given you to eat. These are the Lord's instructions. Each household should gather as much as it needs. Pick up two quarts for each person in your tent. So the people of Israel did as they were told. Some gathered a lot, some only took a little. But when they measured it out, everyone had just enough. Those who gathered a lot had nothing left over, and those who gathered only a little had enough. Each family had just what it asked. Then Moses told them, do not keep any of it until morning. The manna and the quail were miraculously provided. He told them, don't hoard. What we're trying to teach you here, Moses said, is, to, is that God will give you enough each day to handle each day. So he gives them that. And verse 20 is like many of us, but some of them didn't listen and kept some of it till morning. But by then it was full of maggots and had a terrible smell. Moses was very angry with them. That was awesome the way God did that. See, if you hoarded some and you kept it, it stunk. So everybody walking by, hoard. That stuff is nasty. There was, you know, sometimes God will deal with our disobedience silently between us and him. And sometimes he shouts it. Sometimes I, I know in my life, I, especially before the Lord, I had set up things really well so I would never get in trouble. And then boom, the cops come. How did they come? I don't know. They just came. And I have lied in my walk with Jesus. I know you guys never have. But um, I did. And uh, I got caught in it. So I had to lie again. And then, you know, I got all weird. And it, sometimes God lets you for a season go, for a season, and then sometimes not because he wants the lesson to be learned. These guys couldn't take more than a day's worth without it falling apart on them, without it turning away. So God, what's he de dealing with? If you can't trust me on your daily stuff, I will take from what you hoard out of your basket. You thought you were adding more to the basket. You thought the basket of your bread was going to be fuller now that you got more, that you got your weight. No, 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 it, it, you'll lose. You'll take it up. So he's teaching them, young believers. And Moses was angry with them for disobeying. In verse 21, it says, After this, the people gathered food morning by morning, each family according to its needs. So they're marching through the week. They haven't got to the Sabbath part yet. Of taking two. And as the sun became hot, the flakes they had picked up melted and disappeared. Get the picture. So much manna was out there that every family, and that's another thing, every family is responsible for itself. They would gather what they needed for that day out of the abundance. They were learning to leave the rest. They're okay. God's going to provide it every day. Because when you were a slave and when you were struggling, 
Sometimes you thought you had to provide everything. Some of us get on the, the treadmill of life thinking it's all about us. And we lose pieces of our health. Relationships fall apart. We start losing. So they did that. And as the sun became hot, these flakes would melt. And, the, and it would just be desert again. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much as usual. Four quarts for each person instead of two. Then all the leaders of the community, the tribal leaders, came and asked Moses for an explanation. Why are we doing this? Why are we picking up more today than the other days? They didn't know. He told them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow will be a day of complete rest, a holy Sabbath day set apart for the Lord. So bake or boil as much as you want today and set aside what is left for tomorrow. He says, listen. God wants to give you a day off. God wants to give you rest. The word Sabbath has two connotations. One, it means change of pace. He's given you a change of pace in your life. You were slaves. You never had, as I shared earlier, never had days off. How many of us have been ever a slave to anything? It didn't give you any days off. And if you tried to get a day off, it was brutal. And so I'm going to give you a day off and... I'm going to give you rest in it. You'll have enough. This is a blessing. In fact, in the next couple of verses, he's going to say, it's my gift to you. I'm giving, I give my people rest. It is healthy for your life. It is healthy for your body. It's healthy for your relationships. Healthy for you and God. It's a trust thing. So then he says this, so they put some aside until morning. They didn't do anything with it, just as Moses had commanded. And in the morning, the leftover food was wholesome and good without maggots or odor. When God, see, God can take the same thing we want to hoard, and it turns to junk in our life. When he gives it to us, it becomes a blessing. I can take care of you. Moses said, eat this food today, for today is a Sabbath day dedicated to the Lord. There will be no food on the ground today. You may gather the food for six days, but the seventh day is a Sabbath. It's a change of pace. It's the day of rest. There will be no food on the ground. Verse 27, some of them went out anyway. Aren't you glad the Israelites are just like us? On the seventh day, but they found no food, so their labor didn't produce what they were hoping it would produce. Just as Moses, oh, um, where am I at? Okay, but they found no food. The Lord said, ask Moses, how long will these people refuse to obey my commands and instructions? He just gave them two. He just gave them two commands. He goes, because we think God has given us a gazillion rules. Well, before I knew the Lord, I always thought, why even follow God? It's like everything that's fun, no. Everything that's a hassle, yeah, you got to do this a lot. It was like I had all this misconception that God was like a slave master, that God was holding out on me. All he really ever asked us, it boils down to do today well. Do today well. I'll provide for you what you need today. And as we do that on a daily basis, what happens? Our food basket begins to prosper. We become a greater blessing. We have food like Egypt had in the beginning when God dealt with Joseph and helped them. They became the bread basket of the world. Not everything going on in your life is about you. There's a bigger picture going on. And so he tells them, it's a gift to you people that I'm doing this. They must realize, how long will these people refuse to obey my commands and instructions? They must realize, it's a must. This is super important that the Sabbath is the Lord's gift to you. That is why he gives you a two-day supply on the sixth day, so there will be enough for two days. On the Sabbath day, you must each stay in your place. You are to relax. Now, for some of us in our generation, we think the Sabbath day is the day to catch up on all the chores. He's not saying shift this job to this job. 
He's saying, rest. Figure out, pace yourselves so that you have a day of rest, a day to remember God, a day to enjoy the day. That is why he gives you two days supply. There will be enough. On the Sabbath day, you must each stay in your place. Do not go out to pick up food on the seventh day. So the people did not gather any food on the seventh day. The Israelites called the food manna. It was like white coriander seed, and it tasted like honey wafers. Then Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Fill a two-quart container with manna to preserve it for your descendants. Then later generations will be able to see the food I gave you in the wilderness when I sent you free from Egypt. First thing he says is this manna that you guys are sustaining, you're an example for the generations that follow you. This isn't only about you. We're reading it thousands of years later, and yet we can relate to it in our own lives. Oh, this is for us. And he goes, it isn't for you guys, so you are to take some of this, store it, and save it for the generations ahead of you. And he says, and those are the immediate generations. And then Moses said to Aaron, Get a jar and fill it with two quarts of manna, then put it in a sacred place before the Lord to preserve it for all future generations. You are to have what God is doing in your lives and in their lives. There is the now part. There is the part after that. And there is the part way in the future. It is not just about us. So when God is, seems to be taking a long time, it's because he's doing something. Some of you sitting here today are here because generations in heaven before you have been praying down the line for you. This, and what you're going through today isn't just about you. It's for the next generation and the generations after that. When I get to heaven, I'm going to see people I have no idea about. My daughter, Sarah, she did a, a genealogy thing. I don't forget what it's called, but something that you search your family tree. We could only go back three generations. My dad, my grandpa, my great-grandpa. That was after that, it's a blur. There is no recollection. But there are people preceding that. When I get to heaven, I'm going to meet all kinds of people. I'm going to see people from... This time period, oh, you were one of the Israelites? Saved from Egypt? Wow, you guys were sure hard-headed. Hang on, Joe. Let's do a little story on your life. Let's see about you, Mr. Follow Jesus. Let's see how your journey went. See, we're all in the same boat. So we get this to follow. So he says, listen. And this is the same thing for you. you. You single people in here that you want some spouse in the future. You want some. Well, God is doing. He sees beyond your. He's, he wants that. He wants to put that in the bread basket for you. But you got to have some food in there so it's worth that person getting in there with you. Two empty baskets don't make a full basket. So just as we walk with God daily, he adds a little bit. And when we disobey daily, a little bit comes out. It's just the way it is. So what we have, he says, hold on to. Hold on to that which you've been given in the beginning. Hold on to it. Remember, he told these guys, this is the standard. It's the baseline. Everything else builds off of that. It's one day at a time. Trusting God to get you through. And I've told you guys, ever, Teresa and I oftentimes slap five at the end of a day. We got through another one. Got through another one. Didn't get through it perfect. And see, I'm trying to teach two generations down from me about God. I was talking to Gabe the other day, and he goes, Papa, so God always was, he, 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 you know, he has no beginning and no end. I go, that is correct. Okay, how did he get born? I said, well, that's it. He never was born. He always was. Nobody's going to believe that. <laughs> He's right. That's a God thing to believe that. That is a God thing. He's shaking his head. That ain't going to work. 
And it's like, you know, because he's already thinking. So, you know, that, that's a beautiful thing. He's at seven years old, and he's already struggling and processing God. And how does that work out? And why would God let his mom die? And, you know, all those things that he's processing. How does that happen? What is that? You know, where is this God? How does he work? And, uh, and so these guys are the same thing. You're the same way. I'm 30 years. I couldn't wait till I turned 60 because that means that meant I spent half my life in Jesus. I got saved at 29 and a half. So when I turned 60, I, I, half my life now has been walking with the Lord. And I'm a little older than that. I know I don't look it, but you can take my word for it. Um, it's been a, quite the journey. It's been quite the journey. Um, a lot of, I would never have guessed that this is where my journey would have taken me. Um, in so many ways, so it's, some of it is beyond my imagination of greatness. How, wow, I never thought a kid from Santa Ana, wow, would be able to minister and all this stuff. And then other parts of it is I can't believe you allowed that to happen. I, can't, I cannot get it. I don't get it. And so that's, that's our walk with God. But this is the thing. No matter if I'm on the mountaintop or I'm in the valley of the shadow of death, and you will walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I walk behind the cloud. I walk behind the cloud. He gets to lead, and I have to do it one day at a time. And I know this, that it's not only about me. It's about others, and it's about other others that I will have no effect on. I've given everything I got in, in my 30 years of ministry, I've given to Chris. Anything he needs, I'll give to anybody because I know that for us to go farther People stand on my shoulders. They, people will go where I've never been able to go. That is the, the journey. When my dad came over, when my dad, my dad, you know, he died when I was 17, but he left enough money, financial stability, to where my mom could stay at home and raise eight kids and never have to work. But that's not where he came from. He came from Irish parents who immigrated, his mother immigrated at 13 years old because of the potato famine in Ireland. She immigrated to the United States, lived with a family, and was a domestic pretty much her whole life. She entered the land of milk and honey, but she never prospered in the land of milk and honey. And in fact, her child, one of her children, my dad basically provided for them, his dad and mom, all the days of their life once he started working. The Israelites, this generation that is in the desert, the adults of it at that time, the ones who came out of slavery never would enter into the land of milk and honey. They would get to the border of it in their generation and their children entered into the land of milk and honey. That was not their plan, but that's oftentimes the way God does it. We may never enter into what, uh, into what we want, but here's my cry of my heart all the time, that if people come into this church, they leave better off than when they came in. That they go to where God would have them go and be who what God would have them be in our generation. And so we may, I may be able, you know, my daughter birthed her three sons into the land of milk and honey, though she never got to be all there is in the land of milk and honey. But maybe her God's plan was for her kids to get there in a way she never would have wanted and we never would have wanted or desired. I don't know the ways and understand the, the considerations and the intelligence and the planning of God. I don't understand it, but I, I know that I have a role to play and it's always more than just me. So I really want to talk to you people right now that are in that place of struggle and, and you don't know and it doesn't seem the things around you are flowing the way they ought to flow and I get it, but there's more to the picture. There's more to the basket that God is adding into you, just the, the, the bread basket. More, it's, there's more than what you can understand. It goes beyond 
our abilities and capabilities. So be patient. These guys journeyed for 40 years. Let's read the last couple verses. It said, Moses said there in verse 33, get a jar and fill it with two quarts of manna, then put it in a sacred place before the Lord to preserve for all future generations. Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded Moses. He eventually, there was no Ark of the Covenant then. They hadn't even got to Mount Sinai yet where Moses went up and got the Ten Commandments and talked to God. They hadn't gotten to that place yet. So he saved it for a place that he wasn't sure where it was going to be put. It says he eventually placed in the Ark of the Covenant in front of the stone tablets, the Ten Commandments written, which, which were the terms of the covenant. So the people of Israel ate manna for 40 years until they arrived at the land where they would settle. They ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. Our Canaan is heaven. Once we leave here, we are done. We, will, we are to eat every day what God provides for us in every way. And I know there are people out here that long for some kind of a healthy relationship. God's going to do a lot of work in you first. Just like you wouldn't want to bring an empty bowl of bread to your children, God doesn't want you to bring an empty bowl of bread to a relationship. So let him take the length of time to teach us how to walk with him daily so that when God brings whatever comes next, we are used to walking daily with the Lord. We are used to it so that we can continue to walk daily with the Lord. Submission to the will of God today is a higher priority than the meeting of our physical needs, our emotional needs, our relational needs, our business needs, any need. Obeying God today is far more important. I don't have to worry about tomorrow. I don't have to worry about yesterday. If God wants me to deal with something from yesterday today, then I need to deal with that. Whatever God wants for me today, that's what he wants for me today, and that's enough trouble for one day. And we need to do that. They ate manna for 40 years, but not everybody went into Canaan. You will go so far in that journey. Do it well. Do it well. How do you do it well? One day at a time. We may have visions of what we think it ought to be. I say that's cool to have it. It's always good to have a plan. But allow a whole lot of room for that to be adjusted as God would. And sometimes God gives us seasons of stop. That cloud wasn't always moving. There were seasons in that 40 years where it just stopped for a year. And they lived in that environment for a year or more. It wasn't some walk around the desert all the time. There were times of nothing happening in fact, you know the manna? It tells us in Numbers, I think it's Numbers 11, where they said, you know what? We're tired. Tired of the manna. I like honey wafers as much as everybody, but not every day. What did God do? And we're having more. <laughs> I mean, how many ways can you cook quail? You know, it's a bony little thing. Have you ever had a quail lake? That's done. That's what they were, why? Teaching them. Be content in the little prepares you for the greater. How many know all that stuff? Let's stand up. I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. You can pray along with me. Lord Jesus, I ask you to imprint upon my heart to live one day at a time because each day has enough troubles of its own. And those things that are deep in my heart as desires teach me to still live one day at a time. Make me a blessing to everyone around me one day at a time. Teach me 
to treat myself well today, to be good to myself. And I thank you for that. God, fill my bread basket so that I am not only nourished, but future generations. Those things that you're doing in me impact more than me. I understand this. I embrace it. Help me. In Jesus' name. God bless you guys. Have a great day. We'll see you later.